Uh, what I'm going to do is talk uh, briefly, for me briefly, maybe 15, 20 minutes, uh, and then followed by Rabbi Cooper and Mark Lewis. Uh, and hopefully there will be sufficient time in the program, which is not usual, but they have a lot of sufficient time for questions for, for any of uh, you who would like to ask. Uh, I get to introduce myself. I'm, I'm getting old now. I teach at Columbia University. Uh, I've spent most of the last 35 years of my life in the United States government, uh, working in the national security area, of course at the, uh, at the White House, at the National Security Council, later at the Department of Defense, and in the intelligence community. And I guess the last uh, major full-time job I had was as the director of the Defense and Defense Research Projects Agency uh, in the late 1980s, which uh, comes up in the discussion here when we get to talking about the internet. Uh, in any event, I'll press on with this. <clears throat> what I'm going to talk about is slightly different than most of the talks that you're going to hear over the next few days. Uh, most of the people here are actually going through much of the substance that has been in the media. I'm going to talk about the media uh, of the current era and some other comments I've got to make about how this relates uh, to anti-Semitism in the modern world. And I want to start out by talking for a couple of minutes about sort of what I call changing paradigms in media in the world. Uh, in ancient times, biblical times, which fortunately most of the people at this conference won't know more about than other conferences I talk about. What we're talking about in ancient days, we're talking about an oral tradition, because not many people in the world could read or write, sort of like Afghanistan today. Uh, there were very few texts, very few manuscripts. Uh, they were very costly, hard to do, and nobody read. And that was sort of it for most of recorded history. When we get to the Middle Ages, we have an expansion of written and printed matter, as we did have an expansion in literacy of at least what was part of the modern world at that time. And I guess the first major change or what Kuhn at Harvard would have called a structure or scientific revolution was with the invention of movable type by Gutenberg in 1534, uh, which greatly increased the ability to produce media, or printed media it was at that time. And there really wasn't much of a change for the next 300 years. Uh, Benjamin Franklin's printing press looked just about like Gutenberg's did. You know, like big, big crank at a sheet of paper, squish it with the hand, gets them up. Out came a, uh, a sheet of paper, and to those that could afford it and pay for it, maybe they read his paper, but that was about it uh, for that period of history. The next era that came in uh, was not until the sort of mid 19th century, and something I sort of came up with a term, the electronic era, uh, basically came in with the invention of the telegraph by Samuel Morris, uh, something that really did not catch on and proliferate until after the Civil War. Uh, the invention of telephone by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876, which really did not uh, proliferate until some years later. And then uh, radio by Marconi, if you believe that version of history, or Tesla, if you believe that version of history, uh, somewhat later on. But by and large, the history of the so-called electronic era is communications were largely a costly boutique item. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes uh, is the subject of marginal economics uh, more than you know, anti-Semitism per se, because it really is the driver in the modern world. The next era that I want to talk about is sort of the final one in the era we're living in now, which is very, very recent, and something you know we're terming here the internet era. Uh, it sort of sort of started with something called the ARPANET, uh, named after the Advanced Research Projects Agency, an agency of the uh, United States Department of Defense. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about how that transitioned from a Defense Department project, uh, the ARPANET to the Internet in 1989, and then some of the things that came after that, like the, uh, the web and the web browser. Uh, the other thing that took place, and I'll talk a bit about that, is a massive increase in bandwidth. For me, by bandwidth, the ability to communicate. 
things like fiber optic cables, advanced RF systems, and so forth. And the last piece of this uh, that occurred about the same time is what I call digital everything. Everything you're doing in the world is digital now, and the era basically of free communication. So those are sort of three era, or four eras in media. I want to talk a couple for a couple of minutes about what this digital revolution really is. And I want to talk about it in terms of three major things. And the last slide, if I get to this, I, I call the Holy Trinity. It gets a couple of laughs when I talk to Jewish audiences. Uh, the Trinity being made to technology, economics, and culture. Because it's not just a revolution in technology. It's a revolution in all three that have radically changed your lives, your children's lives, and even the lives of you know uh, elderly people like my nine-year-old Holocaust surviving mother-in-law who sits there with her computer and her email and her grand, uh, grand, great-grandchildren's kids images she gets. Uh, the real part about this that started was a radical change in the hardware. It's computers, it's communication devices, it's web-enabled devices where we now have integrated computing and communications and displays. Uh, we've got a new generation of stuff coming along every 18 months. And what we really got, if you look in terms of the dollars for people, is something I call the era of free hardware. Uh, on the communication side, we've had a revolution as well. We've got new ways to actually move information Fiber optic cables are going all over the earth now. There are satellites that move data. We have DSL connections. Many of you have them to your home, your office. Uh, we've got what we call cheap bandwidth at the home and the office. It's really very, very inexpensive to connect the world. We have a world in terms of the technology where we've gone to something called packet switching rather than line switching, which is the great contribution of the internet technology. And sort of the last piece of this world of digital everything is everything that you're dealing with, all of the media you're dealing with, basically are digital. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Documents, audio, video, uh, games, everything now is digital and it can be moved or put on the internet or transferred on the internet easily because it's digital. We don't have to do what in the old days was called an analog to digital conversion. Uh, paper media are basically vanishing. Newspapers have gone out of existence as published paper media. I guess San Francisco doesn't even have a published paper anymore uh, in paper copy. It's all on the internet. Uh, and a lot of a good thing. I mean, when I left the government the first time and moved to Los Angeles in 1974, uh, I used to have to arm wrestle a bunch of Israeli immigrants for a copy of Haaretz. It showed up a week late. It cost $5. There was a lot of money to be there. It's great these days. Haaretz, I get online. It comes for nothing. I can see it at 2 in the morning, and it's in English, so I don't have to struggle with my terrible Hebrew. Uh, it's really a different world. And the world has transitioned uh, in, in sort of every respect from electronic media uh, to other systems. In the area of law, you can't even take a paper brief to the federal court. It has to be uploaded onto their site. Uh, documents are now accepted as scans, emails, no longer the business of an original signature, wax seals, ribbons. It's a totally different world than we had just a couple of years ago. The one that is the, uh, the real killer here, or the second one that's a, a big deal, and isn't often recognized, for those of you who have been in the finance area or studied economics, this is a world of marginal economics. Not only are the devices we're using getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, I, I use the term, everything we get today is cheap crap from China. You can't buy anything made in this country anymore. Uh, everything we get is very inexpensive. It comes from China or one of the Asian countries comes off the internet, free shipping, no tax. Uh, what you're using today are no longer toys for the wealthy. The stuff you're using today are affordable for adults and children. And I sometimes make the facetious remark that every kid over the age of three and a half 
is walking around on a, with, with, a, uh, with a cell phone or some sort of handheld uh, device. Uh, it wasn't that way years ago. When cell phones were first introduced into this country a couple of years ago, not that many years ago, uh, the number was 47 and 47. 47 dollars a month, 47 cents a minute, plus long distance, plus roaming, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the average housewife in Encino is running up a $700 a month bill for her cell phone. It isn't that way anymore. Uh, what we have to understand is that the marginal costs of communications are falling to zero. Uh, you're paying a fixed monthly rate often for a phone at the house, if you're an old person and still have one. Uh, most people now have switched to cell phones for everything. Uh, you know, I've got a cell phone account, there's four phones on the account, myself, my wife, and a couple of our adult daughters who are still charging their phones to us. But I've got over 12,000 rollover minutes. There are no marginal costs. You can talk forever on your cell phone and it doesn't cost another penny. Compare that to the mid-1930s. What was the cheapest phone call you could make from uh, New York to Los Angeles? Three bucks a minute minimum. And that was real money then. So what phone call did it? Hello, dad died, come home, quick. You, know, you can yak forever now and it doesn't cost anything. Uh, the laws of marginal economics apply. There is an absolute massive increase in the amount of use of all systems. Cell phones, internet. Uh, when I first left the government, uh, I looked. The cost of sending a telegram to Europe was 75 cents a word, and they charged you for the period. It was called a stop. And if you were lucky, you got there the next day, and maybe somebody delivered it. You can email the Bible overseas now for nothing with a click of the mouse, it doesn't cost you anything. And if you want a phone overseas, it costs nothing. If you've got an iPhone 4 now, you can download the Skype app. You can call overseas and you can talk forever for nothing. This is a radically different world. The other piece of the marginal economics is that the media are free or nearly free. Most of what you can get off the media doesn't cost anything. Memory now is actually charging some money, but it's a, a fabulous service. Most digital media, audio, video, are either free or very, very inexpensive. You want movies, you nine bucks a month on Netflix, you can download anything they've got. The days of going to Blockbuster Video and spending real cash, long gone. And this is the first time in recorded history that media have become free. And when we invert this and we talk, start to talk about the dissemination of materials, including things like anti-Semitic literature, anti-Semitic video, technology has become the great enabler, and the marginal economics have dictated what's going on. The last piece of this thing, based on the fact that the technology has so radically changed, and the economics have changed, the culture we're living in has also changed. Uh, and it's not just business, it's not government, it's not just the legal system or the, the military or the medical profession, it's everything. It's adults at home, it's students and kids everywhere, it's things I don't even understand that I teach this stuff. Kids standing five meters away from another kid, sending them a text message. Why can't you talk to them for crying out loud? I don't get it. Uh, but it's the way it is right now. Those of you who have students at college, Kids will never call home unless they need money. But they'll send an email. Go figure, it's a different world. The internet and the other devices of the internet era have radically changed how people communicate and how they interact. Uh, email and text messaging and cell phones and PDAs have become a way of life. It's a way they obtain media. It's a way they obtain entertainment. All the electronic exchanges have, in many cases, replaced uh, personal interactions. I was mentioning to somebody uh, the other day that I watched telephones come into widespread use in Israel. And as that happened, it no longer takes seven years to actually get a phone in Israel. You can tint and go down like a kiosk and get them for, for uh, a couple of shekels. But when phones were introduced into Israel as they, later than they were in the United States, the telephone was used as a mechanism by which one arranged to have a meeting by which business was discussed. 
the business wasn't discussed on the telephone. It's not that way anymore. Business is transacted by telephone. Business is transacted by email. It has become secondary to these personal meetings and interactions. The culture has changed. And the other stuff has gone crazy, too. Uh, social networking has now come to be a big thing. Facebook, in the last couple of years, has gone from a dorm room project at Harvard, that, that other place down the road, uh, to 400 million accounts in almost you know the blink of an eye. And then the other guys at Twitter and all this other stuff has come along. It's become a major factor in people's lives that didn't exist two, three, four years ago. Dating sites now lead all other methods by which young people get together and, and get married. And I've got a report that the information I get from the intelligence community and my friends is that J-Date is a, is, a, is a roaring success. My middle daughter found her fabulous husband on J-Date. It's happening all over the world. Uh, it's probably a good thing. Uh, we now have games and other new types of media. And we have websites of all kinds, shapes, and forms from the very benign to the very deadly, including many of them that are anti-Semitic and are the hosts for anti-Semitism. And what I'm going, to, I'm going to say a few things about that, but I'm going to actually leave the substance to my colleagues on the panel to actually, you know, get into that in further detail. But you know, what is what does the internet and these these technologies actually offer for anti-Semites? Very efficient and cost-effective communications, access to all sorts of media and information. It really is the biggest media revolution since Gutenberg and the invention of movable type in the 16th century. The cost of dissemination falls almost nothing. The ease is unprecedented. You don't have to go to the library. You don't have to travel anywhere. You can have the stuff in your own home. As a platform for propaganda, for truth and everything else, anti-Semitism has become very, very inexpensive. It's, a, it's possible to not only disseminate, it's possible to recruit not only people for anti-Semitism, but the Islamic terrorist organizations. It's possible to provide them with training, resources, and support. Uh, we've had anti-Semitic media through the ages. Uh, it's a tradition that goes back to early, early times, Greeks, Romans, and so forth. Uh, you know, I've put a couple of things in here just so I don't have lots and lots of words. You know, we've started in the 16th century with the pamphlets of Martin Luther and, you know, all sorts of other bits and pieces that have appeared over time. Uh, one of the largest things that really has appeared in the old world of anti-Semitism, if you look at it over the last oh, few hundred years, are cartoons, and there's a gazillion of them available, so I won't put up all of them. Uh, other stuff with symbols that we've used before the internet area, things like clothing and badges. Uh, and the last one is sort of the, the one that you see most commonly from the Third Reich. Uh, just to give you a couple of ideas as to why this has happened and happened so quickly, I got, I got an email the other day on, on a piece I'm working on, on the, uh, this whole proliferation of secrets on the internet. One of the uh, newspapers asked me, who was in charge? You know, how did this happen? And I tried to tell him there wasn't anybody in charge. Uh, he doesn't get it. You know, this whole business began, uh, uh, cyber says, as we call it in the net, as an experiment in the 1960s at the Department of Defense at the Advanced Research Projects Agency. It had nothing to do with email, and the web wasn't even part of the concept. Uh, the original network was four computers, one at UCLA, one at Stanford, one at Santa Barbara, Utah. Uh, early on. The transition to the internet took place a few years later in 1989, uh, with all deference to my dear friend Alan Gore, who got a really, really bad rap on this thing uh, as, as his colleague in this monstrosity. Uh, he did not invent the internet. What Senator Gore then, who was uh, chairman of the R&D subcommittee of the Senate Armed Service Committee, did do was introduce a bill into the Congress and the Senate which gave me 250 million bucks to make this happen. Uh, it was Gore's bill, and it was my signature that moved this money to make it happen, and he got a bad rap on that one. But it's sort of My role in this could have been performed by a trained monkey with a pen. Uh, but he, he does 
deserve a great deal of credit in history for standing up and getting us a quarter of a billion bucks, and then a couple years later, another 300 million, uh, to actually transition this from an experiment in the Defense Department to something that's changed the world. And it could have been the best couple hundred million bucks this government has ever spent, but anyway. Uh, what we've had since 89 is an absolute explosion uh, of this technology around the world, and I can absolutely guarantee you, having sort of been there, that it was never expected. Nobody at DARPA, used to be ARPA, they keep changing it, or anyone else ever expected this to take place. Uh, you didn't have these slides, some of you want to look, it's just sort of traces some of the things that took place over the time from an original doctoral dissertation, uh, a RAND study in the early 60s, to some of the things that have come along in the, in the 1980s. Uh, just so you want to see how this thing started, the government asked for proposals from industry, and the request for the proposals on the left side. One company in the country actually responded, Old Veronica Newman. Uh, for those of you who, who like history, uh, IBM sent in a uh, response to the government that said, this is too hard and it probably can't be done. The Digital Equipment Corporation sent in the same thing. This is too hard and it can't be done. And BBNN, who basically figured it out to begin with, sent in this document which said, we think it's really hard. Maybe it can be done, but why don't you give us the money and we'll try. Uh, and that's how it sort of started out in the early days. Uh, what happened over the last you know, years, we started from four nodes on the entire network in 1969, which is not all that long ago. Uh, to today, we have no idea how many people are in there. Probably a couple of billion. We don't know. But it's come along. Why did things change like this? Well, a couple of reasons. All at the same time, uh, there was a paradigm shift. Moore's Law. Very cheap, powerful, integrated circuits. Moore, if you don't know Gordon Moore, he was the founder of Intel. He invented the integrated circuit. Uh, packet switching, a much more efficient way of using circuits digital everything I mentioned, and this idea of cheap communications. All four things at the same time brought about a revolution in the world. You don't want to know this one. Uh, for those of you who like little pictures, this was our first hard drive. It's this thing in the cabinet the young lady's looking at. It took up a chunk of a building. You probably got a 400 megabyte hard drive on your laptop because it's an old one and you didn't get a new one yet. But the world has changed. Uh, I've talked a little bit about what's going on uh, in the world. One of the things that's been mentioned today, and it's probably not useful spending a huge amount of time repeating, is the huge amount of overlap between anti-Semitism and anti-Israel feelings. A massive proliferation of websites, uh, Gabi Wyman in Haifa, who keeps track of these things at his center here, got give or take 800 or so. Uh, Islamic and Al-Qaeda websites, native languages and others. It is the medium for the modern era, and I think Rabbi Cooper's got a couple of things to say about that, so I'm going to leave that piece to him. Uh, one of the questions that comes up, because I'm it's more of a technologist than a uh, biblical scholar, can we stop it, or should we? There are some First Amendment concerns in the US. Uh, the French tried blocking some stuff that didn't work real well. There's really some technical issues similar to blocking the porn sites. It's hard. Uh, maybe you can stop some stuff in the short run. In the longer run, it's very, very hard. There's a lot of sites around, and I think we probably could talk a bit about that. Uh, there's an overlap in some of the areas between anti-Semitism and some of the other radical things we're seeing, uh, particularly the animal rights terrorists, which has become a California problem. I have a sort of personal interest in that, the principal target of the uh, eco-terrorists in the, in the California area it happens to be my wife. Uh, the people getting arrested are in front of my house. Uh, there are cop cars that sit there 24 hours a day. <coughs> there are some of the demonstrators here. And then they firebombed their home twice in the last couple of years. So this whole idea of you know, people going after uh, Jews, things they stand for, their stuff on the internet talking about my wife has hit them with a vagina. Uh, it's not a kind world, and the internet does promote a great deal of this. Uh, I've, I've got lots of examples of what some of the sites look like, which I'll pass on for the time being. Uh, 
I want to make two other points before I yield the floor here about the internet era that go beyond the technology and the communications. There's a couple of things that have happened in the same period of time that have made the situation a whole lot worse. <clears throat> the first one has to do with these four, what Dave Rappaport calls uh, the fourth wave of terrorism. And he calls that the religious wave of terrorism and the rise of radical Islam. It really began in 1979 because of sort of the Iranian revolution, the evolution of the Islamic secular state, uh, a new Islamic century, and the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. <clears throat> there are a lot of examples of Sunni Arab terrorist attacks. Uh, probably one of the other things that had a huge impact was the fall of the Soviet Union uh, in 1989, which was the same year we gave away the, the ARPANET to become the Internet, where you had religion defeating a secular superpower, and the former Soviet Union lands with large Muslim populations becoming fertile fields for terrorists. Uh, the religious narrative, really political events, provided hope for the religious states. The Iranian Revolution showed they could defeat the Soviets. Islam was the heart of this way, but there are others as well. Uh, the American role in the world changed to that of being the great Satan. Uh, the chief antagonist after the Soviet Union was now defeated. Jews are the driving force in American foreign policy, and the need to eliminate the American presence in the Arab world really raised its ugly head as anti-Semitism. Uh, the Quran uh, readings have been covered at great length already today, and you know what they've had to say. The second piece of this is, apart from the Islamic revolution, has been the spread of the Muslim world and the Muslim diasporas today, particularly in Europe. Uh, a short two million in Great Britain, where you've had 30 uh, terrorist plots, 1,500 extremists under surveillance by MI5, 6 million in France, 3 point some million in Germany, and so on, and well over a million in the United States. And these are old numbers uh, that need to be updated. But the basic point is there has been a huge migration of Muslims to Europe and the United States, where they do form a bed and a core for both anti-Israel and anti-Semitic operations. Uh, there's been a huge change in the terrorist model. The 9-11 business is probably a thing of the past, and we're looking more on the drawing on domestic Islamic populations. And they are doing their recruitment through the internet and other methods. And you're seeing these were all taken in Europe. This is not in the Arab world. And I've got a couple of final thoughts before I turn it over to Rabbi Cooper. Uh, first, in the internet era, technologies are essentially key enablers. We have old and new media that are available at radically lower costs and provide widespread access. Uh, the other thing is we live in a dynamic world. The pace of change is very rapid. It isn't going to stop, and we're going to see newer things as we go along and they may be for the worst. Uh, as I was leaving the government at, at the time of Perestroika, I got asked to give a speech on the subject of personal communications in Moscow. So I'm giving this talk on personal communications in 1990, just as the internet was happening. And I was giving a talk, and part of the speech talked about something I call nomadic electronics. I said, in a few years, you're going to be walking around with a single device. It's going to be your telephone. It's going to be a connection to the internet. You're going to have music and video pictures on it. And they thought I was absolutely crazy. They were probably right, but it did come to pass that you're all walking around, well, they probably do, uh, with a gizmo that's got all of this stuff on it, and it's part of your daily life. You have to remember that it's not just the technology. It's what you know. I really call the holy trinity here. Uh, it is technology, it's economics, and it's a change in the culture. The last, uh, the second one I made, this rise of radical Islam 
and continued Israeli-Palestinian discord has been a cover for anti-Semitism of the worst kinds, and we saw a great deal of that this morning. And the pro-Palestinian media, uh, which are not just the sort of wacko far end stuff, you're seeing this in the mainstream media in Europe and the United States, are making problems a great deal worse. And this whole business of the spread of the diasporas of Muslims to the Europe and the United States, it's a fertile ground for terrorism, it's a fertile ground for anti-Semitism, and the problems are getting worse, and I think it's a trend that's going to continue. And at that point, thanks, I'm sort of done on the time I wanted. And now, if you've got questions, I'm happy to take them, but let's let the others do it, and then I'll sort of call on anybody who has questions about what I've said. Uh, the next thing I would like to do is to introduce Rabbi Abe Cooper. It's a real pleasure that he's come to join us today. Uh, rather than just simply reading his biography, which I don't intend to do at all. Uh, I met Rabbi Cooper probably two decades ago when he and his colleague, Rabbi Marv Heyer, were building the Simon Wiesenthal, <coughs> Simon Wiesenthal Center uh, in Los Angeles. And Rabbi Cooper is not only a student of Torah, he's a student of technology. And what they did there was something that was earth-shaking and radical at that point in time. They created a center of scholarship and learning that was different than any other in the world. They not only had the, the Wiesenthal collection of archives, but they sent special technology, which is a commonplace today, but was earth-shaking and had to be created from scratch in those days around the world and brought into the Wiesenthal Center the collections of all other facilities around the world so that a scholar, a researcher, and even a member of the public could go into their center and see these archives electronically in real time, which had never been done anywhere that I knew of. Uh, and I thought that was a pretty radical thing at the time, and uh, these guys historically hopefully will get great credit for what they accomplished both in terms of making the world aware of anti-Semitism as well as making the uh, information available to sort of anybody who wants it. Rabbi. This year, because you really have living history here about uh, the entire dynamic of, uh, of the internet, and not just the part that we're going to be uh, speaking about today. Um, I feel very lucky to have uh, Dr. Wagner uh, at the front, and the Mark, who I heard the uh, Fantastic presentation. I was we were together a week ago in Montreal uh, about Iran. So uh, I know that uh, we'll be covering a lot of uh, territory. Um, I was really nervous about two things as I got up to speak here. One, you just saw it. I may uh, analyze the technology. I don't have a clue how any of this works. So I, I'm very happy that with the right people are here to help out. Secondly. I mean, who, should, who has the chutzpah to get up after Dr. Weiss's unbelievable uh, presentation today? Uh, it's clarity, uh, it's courage, really remarkable, but um, she did get me thinking, uh, of course, off topic, but I, I'd like to share the following uh, true story that happened to me. It has nothing to do with the internet, per se. Uh, one of the uh, areas that falls to the Wiesenthal Center because uh, our international headquarters are on the Pacific, Asia Pacific Rim. We do a lot of work in Asia. I've been to Japan about 30 times. And um, uh, very often we go there when we find one of the major publishing houses or um, uh, TV networks doing something about the protocols and the elders of Zion. So uh, the day came when it was Nikkei's uh, uh, opportunity to get the Wiesenthal Center treatment. If you ever uh, look on TV, the stocks, basically Nikkei is the Wall Street Journal of Japan. Very respected, generally stays away from stuff like this. Anyway, they were um, in some indirect way, but a profound way, about to be involved with a new edition of the Protocols of Zion. Uh, we stopped it in the tracks. So part of the peace treaty that we do with uh, Japanese corporations and by the way, it works like a charm. I'll invite all the other places in the world would be so easy. We catch the company when they do this. Uh, they write a letter of apology. And part of the peace treaty is they have to invite over two or three people from the Wiesenthal Center. And their entire uh, executive uh, command, it could be 150 people, have to take out an entire day 
not only listening to someone speaking in English, but then consecutively in Japanese, which means that by the time I finish my presentation, none of these people ever want to see my face again. So it's a very effective countermeasure, low tech, but effective countermeasure in Japan among the elite on anti-Semitism. So at the end of uh, my presentation was about the protocols, and I brought uh, many uh, original uh, multilingual covers of the protocols that we have in our archives, and I gave a whole hour speech, and I thought it was rather well organized. And then at the end, for anybody who's ever done business in Japan, who's ever lectured in Japan, I did something that only an American would do, but I knew, as he said, that uh, uh, it was really just meant as a uh, sort of an Americanism. I asked anyone if there was a question. And when you give a presentation in Japan, it's very rare that you're going to have an immediate reaction because all interplays are sort of negotiated, they go back, they have a group discussion, and they come back to you. Much to my shock, the executive vice president of Nikkei got up and he said, yes, Rabbi Cooper, we have a question. Okay, what's the question? Well, first of all, thank you for coming and for telling us uh, what the protocols are all about. We now understand that Jews do not, do not go to their synagogue on the Sabbath and plot the economic downfall of Japan. We very much appreciate that. And we know that you don't go to synagogue in order to uh, control the banks or the media. And I said, terrific, I think you've got a good synopsis of the points I want to make. What's your question? This question was, Rabbi, what do Jews do in synagogue? And from the time of that uh, question, I pretty much have changed my entire job description, or more accurately, my approach to my job. And it's sort of, I felt very much connected to Professor Weiss's underlying uh, a point of her presentation is that we really have to figure out a way how to get out from under the uh, automatic defensive posture, you know, we don't beat our spouses, and we don't do this, we don't do that. And here was at least one honest Japanese person who wanted to know, so what exactly do you people do in shul? Anyway, I thought that's something I would share with you. Uh, it's something that I carry with me each day in, uh, in, my, uh, in my work. Um, our first speaker, as uh, actually the inventor of uh, the internet, and someone who used up hundreds of millions of dollars of American taxpayers' funds <laughs> along the way, and as you can see, enjoyed every moment doing it. Uh, I think he gave a, a very good uh, context uh, to the issue that we're looking at today. Uh, I have a, come from a completely different perspective. When Rabbi Heyer, uh, my mentor and, and boss and friend, went to see the late Simon Wiesenthal in 1977 in Vienna and asked for his good name, quoting Shlomo HaMelech, right? The name is more precious than, uh, than oil. Uh, he said, what do you have uh, in mind? If it's going to be a place where you only um, light your outside candles twice a year, great idea, I'll give you a letter of support, it's not me. I'm an activist, so I expect that if you want my name, you guys are Americans, I'm European, I expect as part of this uh, a new relationship uh, that you have to be activists. And actually that conversation leads directly to these uh, uh, to our digital terrorism aid project, which we founded back, I guess, in 1998. Uh, and in the early years, it was uh, you know, very sort of difficult uh, to get the attention in a serious way of the media. A lot of folks didn't understand the technology, myself included, but by virtue of how we got there, we simply followed the rats, meaning we were following the Nazis. And you may recall that uh, we once sent uh, an Australian-Israeli journalist undercover inside the neo-Nazi movement in Germany for six months. You can imagine how thrilled the German intelligence and police services were to meet us in Berlin when we were giving them the results of our six months undercover 
Jewish guys undercover inside the country. But the most important piece that came out from all of that was the fact they learned something and so did we. That the so-called lunatic fringe, this is before internet, they were all using computers. They were using computer technology when the local police in Germany and Austria had no clue what a keyboard was. And uh, we saw from the earliest days of the internet, the first website, which is still around, it's called stormfront.org, uh, back in 1995, the day of the Oklahoma City bombing. Today, uh, we're looking at about over 12,500 problematic uh, websites, uh, news groups, uh, uh, and increasingly social media. And this is just one institution. The numbers, uh, I'm sure, are, are way, way beyond that. And to uh, sort of recapitulate, we'll make one other basic point, and that is, we put out an annual report called Digital Terrorism and Hate. It's in a CD-ROM. Uh, for anyone who'd like a copy of the latest one, I happen to have a couple up here. At the end of the session, feel free to come down uh, and pick up a copy. But the truth is, we're looking at two parallel phenomena. There's the world of hate online, which is bad enough, and most of my presentation will be about that today. Mark is going to cover more in detail the issue of, of terrorism. But there are two parallel planets, and our institutional approach as both an American-based NGO, my colleague Dr. Shimon Samuels, who's based in Paris, and a lot to do with uh, our Yahoo uh, intervention with the French going back many years ago, uh, we're dealing in the U.S. with First Amendment freedoms, freedom of speech. Canada has its own unique approach, and then when you go over to Europe, uh, to Aust Australasia, there are many, there's tremendously different dynamics uh, afoot. But our basic approach institutionally is as follows. If there's a hate website, uh, we try to go to the provider and we say to them, um, by the way, how many people here have ever read underneath, you can't raise your hand, underneath the gray button when you buy a uh, new software or you sign on to a new uh, a service where it says, I agree. How many of you have ever read the entire document, the contract underneath? Amazing. This is one of the highest percentages. There are five people who raised their hand. I have never done so, but we have our senior researchers and other highly paid specialists who do. In other words, it's a contract. And we say to them, if you read your own boilerplate, normally, from our point of view, normally speaking, when you see the stuff, if we show it to you, this violates your own terms of usage, and we want you to throw them out. Now, does that eliminate that information or material from the internet? Uh, it does not. Uh, but overall, I think everyone agrees on all sides of this particular divide that um, trying to uh, encourage good online citizenship uh, is a very good thing, and occasionally it does throw monkey wrench into, into the videos. When we're dealing with terrorism, it's a completely different uh, issue. There, we're not so much concerned about eliminating that posting as to making sure that the appropriate police or intelligence service has seen the same thing, or at least has interpreted the same material that we have. So there, it's much more important to get that, to verify with the police agency they've seen it than it is to remove the information. So, um, sorry for my French, but let's go right to Facebook. Um, and I might as well show you the rest of these because they're all there. Okay. So, interesting thing happened. You know, when you have 400,000 uh, members, and 300,000 more people at Brazilian. No, no, I'm talking about us. Another 300,000 uh, who are signed up for our so-called e -blast. You get a lot of information coming your way. So what happened? One of our members told us, blank Islam was no longer on Facebook, but all the other blanks, all the other attacks on the religions were. So, 
I have to have my speaker from YU, and I wrote, uh, I thought, a very clever letter. Congratulations, Facebook, you did the right thing. Now please take off the other ones. Two weeks later, got back an email from the head poop of some division who said, thank you very much for bringing this to our attention. We're going to correct the situation immediately. And they restored black Islam. <laughs> and by the way, by, by the way, this all happens. This all happens uh, in a much broader context because one of the subtexts uh, of at least my presentation today is that in the last year, uh, our center has uh, uh, met uh, probably with uh, Facebook folks and actually trained some of the Facebook people. Uh, about five or six times. Uh, they're not no longer at 400 billion mark. We think they've surpassed at least 500 billion. And the problems with Facebook, of course, by the way, they wrote in great terms of usage. They sort of understood the th in theory what the problem was. No one ever anticipated that they would be where they're at today. And that's a big problem, not just in terms of hatred, which we'll show you in a little while, but also especially in terms of uh, terrorism. But by the way, why, did, uh, why does Facebook allow these sites uh, attacking religion? Because they consider it to be speech. They're a freedom of speech. Um, by the way, they also consider this stuff, Shawad denial, also be, also be a speech issue. I will say that in, when we were able to show them that the material was coming uh, or validated by a government, in this case Iran, they did take off some of the stuff. So uh, I would just start by saying that, uh, let's say last Thursday we spent five hours at Yahoo. The average age of the, the people we met with, about a third, not half, but a third of my age. Uh, we've been with uh, YouTube and Google, which is an interesting new world for Google never was into content until recently, uh, and I would just say that any of us who have any concerns in these areas you can either send us the material or draw a straight line to these important social networking addresses because that's where the action is at today. Uh, increasingly, uh, that's where hate and terror groups and their support systems are going to. And also, there's one other thing about, I want to get about social networking down, because uh, I want to leave Mark the maximum time also, uh, is that they are sort of disabling our whole numbering system. You know, the media, look, cites a 20% spike in the number of hate postings. 15%, 20%, over 10,000, 12. Well, we live in a world today, as you know, uh, when you uh, when you had that beautiful counter attack on the flotilla from uh, uh, yeah. using humor, right, from from Israel, Carol Glick, went over Carol Glick, went over a million. So everything about these social networks are viral. That's the good news. <clears throat> you can imagine again with the bad news. So do you count uh, every single one of those pages or repetitions as its own? Crime, or do you just do a singular one? Uh, it's rendering uh, all this pretty good. Does anybody know what uh, this is before I go into the details? It's been in the news. Actually, Yad Vashem, I believe, came out and the Israeli government asked them to attack it. This is um, the digitizing of a Holocaust uh, cartoon book that the Iranian government put out about two years ago. This just went up a couple of weeks ago. And Uh, you know, this is uh, history of the world. If you look up at the visuals, one cartoon is worse than the next. You know, I'm here in the presence of Professor Deborah Lipstadt, one of our heroes, and she put everything on the line to fight this stuff and to defeat it. And it reminds me of something that Hillary Clinton said the other week at our meeting on anti-Semitism. She got it right. Is you think you have one part of this issue cornered, and before you turn around, it's morphed uh, in a way so as to allow the 
Iranians to do this kind of stuff and to, in many ways, disable the anti-Nazi laws that Germany uh, has, has had in effective use for uh, decades. Dittlieb Felderer. Anybody know who Dittlieb Felderer is? Of course, but you don't. Yeah? Okay. Dittlieb Felderer uh, is a, did not wait for the internet to become a Jew -hater. He goes all the way back. He actually spent time in jail for slandering Simon Wiesenthal. He is, uh, along with, uh, I guess, uh, Ahmed Rami, uh, the most, pro who's a, a, an ex-Moroccan living in uh, Sweden, the two most prolific uh, Jew haters uh, in, in Sweden. So two weeks ago when we were at Google headquarters and the YouTube, the lady in charge of YouTube content uh, sat in and she was very, she felt very com comfortable and she had everything covered. Dittley uh, Felderer, um, I'm not even going to repeat what this says up here, it's, it's, it's pornography. Okay, he had um, on, uh, on YouTube and Orkut, which is another associated uh, a social net, uh, network site, 35 anti-Semitic blogs. Um, uh, 
uh, make its way into the into the mainstream. I don't even know what to say when I show you this stuff. So uh, Norway, uh, which you might not think is uh, at the top or near the top of our problematic uh, countries, actually is, unfortunately, uh, in many ways, at the top. Uh, Kuhn Hamsen was, uh, I think, the first Nobel Prize winner for literature in Norway. Uh, his 150th anniversary just came. The government spent a couple of million dollars to rehabilitate him. Uh, he actually, during World War II, gave Joseph Goebbels his Nobel Prize. He was so enamored with what the Germans were doing, didn't particularly like the United States. Wasn't necessarily an anti-Semite, but this again reflects, rediscovering Good Hampson, this reflects uh, an ongoing attempt to um, you know, re, uh, redefine memory and to try to minimize, marginalize, and deny what happened in the show up. Pin the tail on the Jew, Facebook page, and here we go with protocols, Egypt. How many of you heard about this? Right? Well, let's see how it's really difficult that poor guy, but I'll tell you enough. <laughs> but again, here's a perfect example of how old hatred, updated to the 21st century, in many ways incubated online, sort of kept alive, and then when the appropriate time came uh, to try to move it forward. Uh, everybody knows what the Israeli uh, military hospital and uh, 200 plus people, what they were able to achieve. Uh, even the BBC, CNN, everybody saw what it was, the whole world saw it. However, there were some anti-Semites who saw another wonderful opportunity, which was, what's the real reason the Jews are there? Answer, to continue their whole approach of stealing human organs and making a business out of it. You, we can sort of snigger at it, laugh at it, dismiss it, picked up by the Iranian news media, uh, and uh, as we know also earlier, just a few months before, we had the front page story in a leading Swedish newspaper in which the, uh, suddenly uh, the uh, government of Sweden overruled its own ambassador in Israel and withdrew its uh, condemnation of, of that hate thing. So what used to be a kind of, if you will, a flat or one-dimensional promotion of an idea will now make its way to YouTube, uh, just quickly, this was the guy T. West who, who did it. Um, some of the classical Jew hatreds making their way back. This is from Palestinians. Um, you'll excuse me if I skip here. I actually have a uh, a rap, anti-Semitic rap. But they don't. I don't think you need to see that. Now here's. Um, a very interesting thing also, and that's trying to control or re redirect or reformulate news. Uh, this uh, gentleman, John Patrick Bell, in case you forgot, he's the man who came down the uh, subway at the Pentagon, uh, and uh, he was failed. he wounded two security guards and he was killed. There was absolutely no indication that this uh, gentleman had anything whatsoever to do with any anti-Semitic views or whatever, that didn't stop the neo-Nazis and the white supremacists online from taking ownership, if you will, of that deed. And then, of course, you had James von Braun, if you remember, he died in prison recently at the age of 89. Uh, here, again, is a classic uh, kind of, I think, internet story. This is a man who not only kept his hate alive over decades, for him, the internet provided the ultimate validation of his views. This guy was very hyperactive online, and uh, eventually he decided that he wanted to go out and uh, uh, act out on his uh, hatred, and you know he was the one who attacked and uh, murdered the uh, security guard of the U.S. Holocaust Museum. And of course, when he died, 
he became a big hero to the online bigots. This is actually from Canada. It's really interesting. It's a great website. They actually have most of the top headlines of the day. They just make one little change. Whatever bad happened, they just insert that the Jews did it. And it looks like a pretty you know, good uh, news source at first look. Uh, how many of you heard about the Beat Jew? It actually started with uh, Beat uh, Brunette. It was uh, a, uh, a cartoon uh, series. I wanted to download it and bring it, but they pulled it. Uh, yeah, it was a, it was a, uh, it was a uh, uh, what's it called? Something Park, South Park. Actually had this thing they said, go out and beat uh, all, all the brunettes. And unfortunately, in the U.S. and Canada, there were numerous examples where people followed up and did it. So here you had a couple of very clever seniors at a San Diego, California high school, two weeks before graduation. Not the riffraff of the class, the top of the class, in which uh, they posted to Facebook, beat the Jew, the three or four Jews in the class. For those kids, you know, it should have been the highlight of the young lives. It was a complete uh, nation of it. And it goes into some detail about how to do it, and got some local media out of it, etc. Um, one of the things that we're all focused on, anyone who's looking at the internet, uh, are conspiracy theories. The internet was made for conspiracy theories and vice versa, and you can imagine which ones. And guess who co-opted it? The more serious people, the terrorists. We've had now the so-called, uh, you know, the individual, uh, the, the shooter at Fort, uh, uh, that of Fort Hood, you've got uh, Jihad Jane, and all the rest of these individuals. Here you have uh, Hezbollah working out. Boycott, I don't know if you've seen this one. That's an American site. And uh, something that we'll probably be taking up next year in more detail. Something that has not gotten enough attention. I want to make it very clear that I don't consider to be the website, I don't consider websites of mainline Protestant uh, religions to be paid websites. They are not. But when they pick up and embrace uh, things called like the Palestinian Christian Kairos document, which denies the rights of the Jewish people to their own state, uh, and uh, calls for an embrace of the uh, of super secessionism, of a, of a theology that basically said today's Jews have no connection to 3,000 years ago. We have no legitimate past. Our, uh, when the Torah talks today, when we read the Torah today, it talks about Israel. It's the new Israel. The only time the old Israel, meaning us, kick into the, uh, to this new narrative is when the prophets talk about curses. When it talks about curses, we can have ownership. When it talks about anything to do with the Holy Land, the Jews have no connection. You now see in the, uh, uh, in the various biennial and annual meetings of major mainline Protestant denominations a seepage of this theological hatred uh, into their mainstream. The internet plays an important role, not only in the promotion, but by the way, an important role for us to see what their, what their tactics are. Um, I'm going to um, uh, stop here because I myself want to hear a lot more about the terrorism aspect of my colleague uh, Mark. But I, I will say uh, again, if you see something that you feel needs to be dealt with, my first suggestion, urging, is draw a straight line to the provider get an answer, that's the best during a straight line. Secondly, please empower your children and grandchildren. They already know about this stuff. But actually, it would help if you actually spoke with them. 
If you're having a problem with a particular provider, you can throw us an email. But if you see something, or your, your kids or grandchildren see something, we have a simple email. It's the letter I, I report at leasingthehome.com. Please send it along to our attention, and we'll try our best to do our, our share. Thank you, Rabbi Cooper. Uh, as always, you've done a marvelous job, and I was particularly thrilled to see the uh, extent to which you've woven the uh, social networking material with your presentation. Uh, Mark, with the of, of well, taking advantage of the, uh, the mentally incapable and, and here in other cases of children, U.S. government needs to go on the offense in order to discredit the jihadist narrative by making these examples available through the Muslim world. In other cases, they can use things like search engine optimization. This is when you do a Google search, and I'm sure many of you have Googled your own name and found really interesting things associated with that. I know I have. Well, search engine optimization allows you to influence the top 10 searches that are connected to any keyword search. So if you put in Osama bin Laden uh, in an Arabic site, more often than not, words will come up like hero and, and martyr, a uh, great defender of the Muslim faith. Well, with search engine optimization, you can actually change that listing so that the top 10 that come out actually reflect who this man is. Uh, this is something that, again, it's a simple tool that's used in the corporate sector all the time and very helpful for shaping the narrative. I'm going to end by highlighting some of the challenges, uh, clearly First Amendment issues, um, legal restrictions that exist out there, out outdated laws. Um, there still is an education deficit, despite the great work that Rabbi Cooper's doing in memory and Palestinian Media Watch. There is still a reluctance in this country to go after media outlets, as there is a reluctance to go after charities. And terrorist organizations are exploiting this by using seemingly innocuous institutions uh, to operationalize their terrorist activities. Thank you.